I started coming across this group uh, getting assigned to shoot ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition mm -hmm. Unleashed Power. They were fun, they were funny, they had lively photogenic actions. We'll go back mm -hmm. to the 80s! Good. Big hair! The Reagan years! There were all these people from across the country. Uh, a lot of cranky, act-up New Yorkers. Uh, <laughs> people from act-up L.A., people from act-ups in the Midwest. It was a national demonstration. You'd hear whispers about so-and-so having the package. Well, you still hear it today, but... Uh, there was a lot of fire and brimstone type creatures talking about gonna go to hell. People really didn't talk about it, but you just knew. You just knew. Kept hearing my friends talk about their friends, their tricks, their... Uh, their neighbors, someone down the street who had this thing. And the next day was the, the demonstration at the CDC to try to um, broaden the definition of AIDS. Mm -hmm. At the time, it was very limited. Um, it didn't include a lot of women-specific mm -hmm. um, opportunistic infections, a lot of opportunistic infections that involved, that uh, we saw mo mainly in injection drug users. Mm -hmm. Basically, uh, back in the day, it was what what uh, doctors were seeing in gay white men. And there was the perception that, you know, only gay white men had it. I ain't got that faggot disease. Nah. As I was learning the city, I came across Southern Voice newspaper. They needed a, uh, at the time they had volunteer photographers. I knew which end of the camera to put my eye, so I volunteered for Southern Voice as a, as a photographer. 90 days after starting, there were so many people that were positive mm -hmm. until I started to feel bad. It was nuts. What am I supposed to do now? Mm -hmm. I'm telling these people they've tested positive for HIV and what? You know, nothing. And then someone donated a space over at the Dunbar Neighborhood Center. Mm -hmm. I had never been over there. There were times when we had to hit the ground for gunfire coming out of there, but mm -hmm. we did it. Mm -hmm. We met every Wednesday night at 6.30. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we would pick people up in alleys. We'd pe mm -hmm. pick people up in malls. We'd pick people up wherever they wanted us to pick them up. And then we would bring them back to those places so that people didn't know who they were. Mm -hmm. And so for about a year, we had this underground network of addicted people with HIV. That, and we mm -hmm. would meet mm -hmm. once, you know, once a week. Um, and then after doing that group for about two years, we got summoned by CDC. And I was like, oh my God, what did we do? <laughs> we have done something. I don't know. There was so much death. There were probably, like I said, a sprinkling of heterosexual IV drug using black men. But for the most part, the, they were all black gay men. And they were dying. Oh, man. It was so bad, you know. It was so bad back then. After I had been clean here, and I had never been clean that long, probably about five and a half months, almost six months. I got a call from Los Angeles that said that a man that I used to shoot drugs with every day had AIDS and died. Well, you see, way back then we had heard about it, but it was, I mean, you know, we were old addicts. We always cleaned our works with bleach, and, you know, there were mm -hmm. just, we, it was a ritual kind of thing that mm -hmm. we did, and, you know, it was just not concerned. It was almost like A-I-D-S. Who was concerned? We were dodging herpes. I had also been asked by Aid Atlanta at that time to facilitate a support group. And these men were IV drug using men and they were abusive um, because they were in an environment that was practically all gay white men and they were so abusive. This site is going to 
bring a lot of addicted men and women with HIV out, you know, and we need to be able to do something for them. I went into the substance using community. You know, we don't know anything about HIV, and, you know, we think you're nuts. You know, you it's hard enough to get people not to use, and you're around telling them they got HIV and don't get high. You know, you're nuts, and we're not going to deal with you. The AIDS community was like just the opposite. Well, we don't know anything about substance abuse. and They would draw your blood, and then they'd give you a little sticker with your number on it, and then you had to come back two weeks later. And when I went back, they handed me an envelope, and you kind of peel it open like that and read it to see what it said. Um, at that time, you know, people were jumping out of windows. They were jumping off the freeways, everything. So I opened my letter, and it said, you, you were negative. However the jargon was at that time is, I was negative. Well, I didn't believe it. I was working in drug treatment at that time, and I was doing community presentations, and people weren't ready for HIV, especially in the black community. I mean, I, I remember sending out some 60 letters to black churches saying, let me come and talk with your folk. And I remember that I got a response from three, and on the days that I had the appointments, two of them weren't there. Um, but it was really, really hard. It was real hard. There were six of us, a probation officer, a woman who was very close to me who had AIDS at that time, two other substance use abuse counselors who happened to end up being my husband and my sister, um, another therapist, a wonderful woman, another mental health professional, and we began some cross-disciplinary training that we did for about six months. And then I took the first group of people into my living room. There were four. And I had an apartment that was probably about as big as this room. Then there were more. And there were more, and there were, well, when there got to be like 10 of them, 10, 11 of them, it was like, we're out of here, you know. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't find anybody that would donate to me. It was really hard. Nobody wanted to deal with these people. Nobody wanted to deal with them. It was hard enough. Just substance users, HIV, majority of them black, half of them gay, bisexual black men and women. You know, a lot of times the fight was like, but because it wasn't a comparison study, you know, it took a good while to get it published. It was finally published in AIDS Care. What it was was a catalyst for us. Yeah. Um, we were able to get a space down in um, downtown Decatur, not too far from the train station. It was a big house, a big old house, and had these great, big, huge rooms. It had a half acre backyard. It's hard enough. Um, not using, it's just such a difficult thing that unless you've had some catastrophic kind of addictive incident or, or experience, you just can't imagine what that's like. When I'm sitting there in a drug treatment center where people come to try to get better, and then I'm in that facility and I'm saying, and you also have HIV, it's like, what's all this for? It's because of these men who never had a safe place to be gay and who did what you told them to do. You told them to go get married. And you told her to ignore the fact that he's gay. And if you pray and you're the right kind of woman, he'll be all right. That was the first drug. And there were a lot of mixed feelings about it because finally we had something. The side effects were as bad as the disease. Okay, you have a brother come down with AIDS. Or a sister, in some cases, but sisters knew how to hide it better because nobody thought they had AIDS. So uh, when her hair changes texture, she just fixes it differently. But a guy, skin tone changes, his hair texture changes, he's lost weight or he gained weight, or, and this is all because of AZT, and it's the only drug we have. Once you start making those, that kind of dramatic physical change, In, in my experience, because the bar was still the seat of the community, they would have fundraisers. They would allow us to come in with safer sex information. They put condoms on the bar and fish bowls. Uh, they allowed folks to stand at the door and pass out stuff. And, and they would come to Aid Atlanta with money and with volunteers and with furniture and with 
stuck. If one of their own was ill, they supported them because that was where, where gay life was centered. And so when AIDS hit, the bars responded. Not all bars responded the same, not all responded well, depending upon who was managing. Some bars were owned by straight folks who didn't quite get it until after they lost about four or five friends, and here they come. And that didn't take long back then. And they come to terms with their sexual identity. They're teenagers, they're young adults, they're sexually repressed, and the first place they get their needs met is in a bar with a drink in their hand. And to ask them to shift that identification away from a nightlife, away from a drink, away from the, the whole atmosphere of a bar was so jarring. Bars weren't necessarily owned by the people who went to them. Now, there were exceptions to that when Mr. Foster opened up Foster's on Peachtree, and his head bartender was Loretta Young, and she later opened Loretta's. And it wasn't uncommon for women's bars to be owned by men. So when you went to the bar to get a drink, you may not be looking at somebody who looks like you. So you're giving your money to an institution that doesn't reflect you. And that also played on people's minds. Now, Atlanta was the exception in that we had black bars. Um, in the 80s and 90s, we had big black gay bars. There was a threefold risk of AIDS when it first came out. You either had to be born Haitian, you had to be an IV drug user, or a gay man. And most black folks we're not, at, in 1982, saying, I'm a gay man. Oh, I don't believe that I'm at risk if, in fact, I'm a black person in a black community only socializing, only having sex with other black men, which was ludicrous, of course. There were places of anonymous sex where race was not an issue anyway. Black and white men together celebrated their 20th anniversary about... 20 or 30 of the men who helped me become who I am are gone. There are organizations who didn't recuperate from those kind of losses. I know among the black gay organizations, when we lost five or six people and four of those were board members, you couldn't replace them, not with the same level of talent and ability, and we struggled. I think that a lot of white men did not consider themselves racist because racism was a problem of straight people. This is systemic of how the black community has chosen to deal with everything. We can come together and provide for them even a safe place to speak to the needs of the community to address the issues of HIV, to actually show that love and compassion that's supposed to be the foundation of all of our religions anyway. And they don't have to worry about doing it within the context of, of their religious organizations that are still trying to figure out how we're going to respond. So it was, it was a really wonderful thing that at first looked like it would divide our community, but it actually was an opportunity to pull us all together. The founding board members who had struggled with trying to get an organization together for about six months and they need an executive director. Well, I was asked to consider taking that position to help them get their 501c3, get the board a little more organized, raise $2 million to develop a facility. So I took that challenge on because I was concerned about what I was seeing and hearing in the community about this AIDS epidemic, and we didn't know that much about it back in 1988. So uh, that's when I agreed to come on board with them beginning in 1989 to actually get Jerusalem House purchased, renovated, expanded to provide housing for 23 people living with AIDS. There was a tremendous difference in the response to HIV. In the early days, there was this misconception, oh, this is the little white gay men's disease, and as long as we stay from those little white gay men, we're okay. And I think in the African-American community, traditionally, there has been a major denial factor about homosexuality. And if it's not denial, it's rejection. So we've 
I think in the African American community, I've always been slow to <clears throat> respond to things like this. What we saw, a lot of young men had been practicing a life of homosexuality for a long time, but it was not known. They were very discreet about it, and no one knew that they were gay. Well, obviously, this dread disease uh, disclosed a lot of the sexual uh, lifestyles of people. So once that was known, it, for some it was very difficult even to continue in the same circles. And I guess in some respects, if there's any good side <laughs> of a disease, it actually helped America, I would say America, to face the fact that there are a lot of people who are gay, who, and then some that are bisexual. And buried my husband. We have these three kids. I found out when my husband, when I went to the doctor, found out I'm HIV infected. My husband's gay. He's dying, and I'm infected too. So that's the the sad thing, and more, that's more prevalent in the African-American community than mm -hmm. any other. The African-American community is always hit twice as hard. And I think those compounding factors that contribute to that is one, the denial. I think the thing that initially divided the community in terms of the stigma with AIDS was the very same thing that drew maybe an inner community closer together. And this is what I say, I have not seen anything like HIV that integrated people along gender lines, racial lines, socioeconomic levels, culture, religious orientations or beliefs. And that's why Jerusalem House and many organizations said we want to be an interfaith organization because if anybody ought to have a compassionate response to this disease and to the people who are living and struggling and dying with it, it ought to be the faith community. Working at United Way, I was there I think five years maybe before it was really known that we had an epidemic and there was talk about this gay men's disease out in San Francisco and they weren't really sure what was going on or why, where did it come from and we didn't have I guess hardly any money dedicated to the study of HIV at that time but learning that apparently it was transmittable through sex with other men but I remember all of the scares of that time can we get it just breathing, being in the same room with someone breathing the air or this you know, myth about mosquitoes? And mm -hmm. so we went through all of that. Uh, I don't suppose when we first started out there was anyone that we knew that was heterosexual, or at least proclaimed heterosexual, to be infected with HIV. So there was even more of a need for a Jerusalem house because once it was known that a person was HIV positive or living with full-blown AIDS, they were not oftentimes accepted into their family, so that it was not an option to go back home to die for many of these young men. And that was the most devastating, devastating thing about it, to see these very young men in the prime of their lives who had done very well, most of them, uh, educationally and career-wise, but now just seeing that spiral down of everything, loss of job, ostracized from family, losing all their health benefits, and then ultimately losing their lives. So it was really devastating. So The sad thing about in those early days, if it were known then immediately if they were in a church they would probably be ostracized or the family was have that kind of what I call double whammy okay John we're finding out here you're 25 years old we thought you were soon to be married and here you are you're gay and we our religion or our social ethics you know just don't can't accept that and also we find out that you're dying 
So it was tremendously difficult on families as well. And in those days, there was not much for family because I guess being the Bible Belt of the South in Georgia is really hard to go and say to your pastor, to your congregation, I need help. My son is gay and he's dying from AIDS. So there, was, there weren't many places to go. So there were support groups being formed in the community. Most of those came out of the gay community, out of compassionate, caring organizations like Jerusalem House, which really had, oh, in the earlier days, anywhere from 100 to 200 volunteers. And what we found out, a lot of those volunteers had buried their sons or were struggling with the same issues or had brothers or family members, cousins, who were struggling with this as well. And it was their way of giving back and helping. And it actually became a support group. And many other support groups started to form in those days. All of the, the scares, the phobia about how it's acquired and watching a community divided along gender lines. But uh, we're a lot further along, I hope. I don't know, I'm still concerned about Georgia. Still seems to be somewhat backwards to what really needs to be done in terms of HIV detection. But in those days, it was a death sentence. And that's why Jerusalem House was developed, was organized. There was a desire to provide a place of compassionate care unto death. We wanted to provide a place without discrimination where there could be love and compassion and help as they needed it and they knew they had a place. If they didn't have anything else, they knew they had a place to live quality, a quality life as long as they could, but then to die with dignity and not be in a hospital or somewhere in an apartment complex by themselves. And that happened a lot in those days, that people would literally be found dead where they had lost their lover and then by themselves. So we filled a tremendous void then. I'm very grateful for the advancements to know that it doesn't have to be a place to die now, but there can be extended life resume work and have a reason to live before we would see young men that really wanted to die because they had nothing to live for, nothing to live for. So we've come a long way, but still a lot more is needed. I think the, the, the epidemic started to become real with me about 1985 in the beginning stages of the epidemic. At that particular time, they did not have a lot of different, um, uh, a lot of different medications and a lot of different services and a lot of different agencies that were dealing with the HIV and AIDS virus. We didn't even know a lot about it in 1985. It was new. It was the first couple of years. They, they, they said it was in gay men in San Francisco. And then I moved to Atlanta in 1990 and continued my volunteer here with Aid Atlanta. I started volunteering in 1991. So my initial contact was something that I thought affected me, but what motivates me was the, were the things that affected other people. I wanted to keep myself from getting infected. I wanted to keep my two high school daughters at that time, I had two children in high school, I wanted to keep them from getting infected, their friends from getting infected. I wanted to stop the infection in 1988. And I felt like if we started doing, doing real, hardcore education with young people, that we might be able to put a stop in this virus, or at least kind of put a slow down the number of infections. The public perception was, of course, just looking at gay white men. That's all they saw. But there was, I think, a little bit of hysteria because people did not know what the disease was and they didn't know how to catch it. They, they told you how you contracted the disease. We knew the body fluids that it lived in, but people didn't believe it. And I also remember people rejecting my friends. 
people rejecting me because I stayed her friend. Um, people telling me to wash my hands. I remember a, a neighbor telling me to wash my hands before I picked up her grandchild. Early perception was hysteria. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to be around you. I don't want to have anything to do with you if you got something to do with the maids, folks. I remember the day that um, it was 92 when Magic announced that he was HIV positive. And that afternoon, I had been working all afternoon, and I went to the post office that evening and was standing in line at the post office, and a woman behind me said, well, I should have known something was funny. He was always kissing that boy that played for Detroit. That's how he probably got the AIDS. I turned around and looked at her and said, you know, you are really ignorant about this and you need to educate yourself. You can't get it from kissing. The only way you can get it is through sex. And who's to say that he slept with a man? He probably got it from a woman. He says he's had a sexual. He's ne never shown any, any evidence of being anything else. He probably got it from a woman. You just don't want to admit that that women pass this disease just like men do. If you engage in this behavior and you don't use a condom and you mix these body fluids, you put yourself at risk for something that is not that cannot be cured by penicillin. We're not talking about gonorrhea or syphilis, something that's going to go away. This is something you are stuck with and people are dying of it. And I think the black community just sat back and said, oh, it's not, it doesn't affect me. It only affects those white gay men, you know. White gay folks. That's the only folks that are going to get this disease. That's what the black community said. That's what black churches said. That's what black community said. Black gays, black gay men started to actually acknowledge and claim this disease has, yeah, because it was a gay disease. But I think that the heterosexual audience of this country did not start to think about this disease until after magic was 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 uh, said to be HIV positive, and then still a lot of folks still don't claim it now. We still have a hard time getting messages in at churches. We still have have to do abstinence only messages in high schools. It was so ironic. Yesterday I was at this high school and we and we were doing we were talking about HIV and AIDS and we were giving them all the information on HIV and AIDS, but it was an abstinence only program. We couldn't give out condoms. And there were thirty five girls in that school that were pregnant. I asked the nurse, how many pregnancies did she have? She said she had thirty six and three had already delivered. So there were thirty nine girls there that were pregnant in that school. There were thirty five sitting there, all this big old fat bellies just sitting there. But we can't give out condoms because the school district says that these kids aren't sexually active. Well, somebody's sexually active because they're getting pregnant. In the black community, they have not taken charge and said, this is mine, like they did with sickle cell. This is a disease that affects us. So we need to get tested. We need to get education. We need to do this. And every, you know, everywhere there was sickle cell information because we claimed it has our own. It was our disease. It was something that affected us. We needed to get instruction on it. We needed to find out how to fight it. We needed to find out how you pass it. We claimed that. And because we claimed it, we took the steps to fight it. We have never claimed HIV and AIDS, and I don't think we ever will, because it relates to sex. And if it relates to sex, blacks don't want to claim it. We're not sexually active. Are you kidding? Since the beginning of the epidemic, 21 million people have died worldwide. So you say another 10 years, we're going to lose another 10 million? We need prevention. We need education. We need intervention. We need harm reduction. We need money for advertising. We need to get the message out to every young person or every person who's sexually active that you're putting yourself at risk for something that, that's going to kill you. And we need to do that, and we need to do it soon and fast or I don't know what's going to happen. I've talked to, to young women and young people who have said, you know, I really am changing the things I do. I got an email from a young woman who said, you know, I'm tired of men just running through my body and after listening to you. So, I mean, that's one person. If that's one person that, that, that doesn't get infected, I've done my job. I think the, the, the epidemic started to become real with me about 1985, in the beginning stages of the epidemic. At that particular time, they did not have a lot of different, um, 
a lot of different medications and a lot of different services and a lot of different agencies that were dealing with the HIV and AIDS virus. We didn't even know a lot about it in 1985. It was new. It was the first couple years. They, they, they said it was in gay men in San Francisco. But it started to get real for me when I saw a woman being interviewed who had received tainted blood about 1981 or 82 in a surgical procedure, and she now had this deadly virus. It w was I at risk? Was I doing something? Could I do something to find out about the disease? But it started to get real for me when I saw a woman being interviewed who had received tainted blood about 1981 or 82 um, in a surgical procedure, and she now had this deadly virus. And I was a little bit disturbed because I was like, well, wait a minute. I had some blood. I had a surgery, a major surgery in 1981 and had received blood at that time. And I thought that maybe, you know, did I get tainted blood? Did, was I at risk? Was I doing something? Could I do something to find out about the disease? And that's when it first began, began, began to become real to me. But I didn't know it was going to how it did her in the end. I did not know it was going to be like that. That's the first person I ever knew had AIDS. And, and, and back then, I really didn't know anything about AIDS. And it seemed after that, I became more aware. I think at the beginning, everybody thought it was so highly contagious. I think we were ignorant and we didn't know. And there wasn't a, no Ryan White, no social network, no centralized case management. And I think out of about five sessions, we discovered that of the women in the room who were living with AIDS and who were either actively using substances or were in recovery, 100% of them had a history of sexual or, or physical violence in their background. All of us who are originally impacted by HIV and AIDS are somewhere in the margins, whether we're women, whether we're black folk, substance abusers, gay, bisexual, transgender, lesbian, whatever. We were dying like mad. Unbelievable. We would have someone show up at the clinic and be gone in a month. I mean, the average lifespan at that point from point of diagnosis was six months for at least three or four years in there. Why are we dying like this? at least in the urban setting, within the communities, within the housing areas, on the streets and in the neighborhoods, people saw people dying. And that became clear, women losing partners and finding out their status. I think another advent for us um, obviously had to have been any of the information in the media, whether it was around Willie Smith or Rock Hudson or you know James Baldwin or all these different people out there um, that were, were dying in the late 80s. This was 85, after the big Rock Hudson announcement. It's very difficult to be in a space with at least 50 black folk, and at least a third of them don't know somebody, have somebody, or related to somebody in their family who's been in prison. And you probably would have a quarter of the people in the room who know somebody or related to somebody or know somebody who knows somebody who's HIV positive or who has died of AIDS. Because the minute somebody sees a young, active, healthy-looking adult with a half-fair card, they automatically know that they must be living with AIDS. It's that culturally um, conscious now in the sense that there are small things like that that people are, on a real quiet level, quite clear about. And, and that's where stigma and discrimination still come in not finding out about their status until they were on the floor of the Grady emergency rooms or um, when they delivered their babies. I mean, some of the issues in terms of managing HIV and, and understanding and, and living with HIV or living with AIDS or an AIDS diagnosis had a lot to do with getting the right information, getting the diagnosis at the right time. People were just not educated. In the late 80s, early 90s, I think the two things that changed were, one, um, with the advent of the AZT-076 study that began uh, recommending or, you know, we started the HIV testing 
of uh, all pregnant women, particularly in the public health settings, the, the word started spreading through families that it's hard to discriminate if you don't know. If you know, <laughs> or you think you can make some assumptions about a situation, so like people began to make assumptions. If you're a drug addict, you must have AIDS. Because of white male privilege, regardless of sexual identity, that community has been able to move closer to the center as a result of their tremendous and powerful work on HIV and AIDS, no doubt. Mm -hmm. And what should have been a coattail ride didn't necessarily go that way for the rest of us. And so it's been a slower process of trying to move. I think the biggest closet in the world holds black men's sexuality in it. You know, hidden sexual identities or hidden sexual behaviors. And then I think in the early 90s, the next thing that did it was the um, changing of the definition, the augmentation of the CDC's definition of AIDS, which doubled the count in a year. And then it was all people of color. So I mean, <laughs> and women, <laughs> when they actually started to include some of these other um, opportunistic infections. And that alone, I think, you know, when more people were actually diagnosed and going home on disability or turns out that um, we became like the only safe space in town for women to talk about each other. And so a lot of positive women were ending up in our workshops that were about prevention.